Ryan. Matt, good morning. Hey, good morning, man. Good to have you on this side of the camera today. It's fun. It's it's different being on this side of the camera versus yeah. the producer. Uh, hats off to you and the guests who do this on a on a regular basis. Uh, but it's fun though. It's fun being on this side. It's fun being on that side. Yeah. So you want to introduce? Obviously, you're the producer. Yeah. So uh, Ryan Barthel, obviously the producer of the show. Yeah. Uh, you know, been doing this with you for the past little over ninety days, and uh, what a fantastic journey it's been. You know, from Limitless with the thousand plus subscribers we have in such a short period of time, you know, that gives me confidence and excitement that the messages that we're sharing, the people that we're talking to, the investigations, if you will, that we're doing, the guests are responding to that. The viewers are responding to that. And that's really exciting to be a part of that. Yeah, we got a good one today. Okay. Uh, yeah, I wanted to bring you on the the show on this side of the camera and just let you be able to ask a few questions as I kind of go through a thought because I can't get this thought out of my head. It's um, something that I've been thinking about for a while, uh, several months now. I think that it, it might explain some of the work that Randall Carlson is doing, some of the stuff that Jimmy Corsetti's talked about in Africa. Uh, some future guests might want to talk about this. So I figure I'd get this topic out there, see what people think. Let's do it. Let's get into it. Yeah, 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 for sure. Yeah, man. So the the thought, the idea, and, and my family's tired of hearing me talk about this. So <laughs> it's good to be able to, to, to talk to you about this today. I appreciate you coming on this side of the camera. But it's essentially that it's a question and it starts with a question. The question is, has the earth ever stopped rotating or slowed down its rotation? Yeah. And so the earth, obviously, everybody knows travels around the sun. And as the earth travels around the sun, it's spinning and it spins one rotation, one full rotation. That, that equals a day. And the question is, over any time over the last 4 billion years, has the Earth slowed down on its rotation? And what were to happen if the Earth did slow down its rotation? And so interesting to note that the Earth rotates at about 1,040 miles per hour at the equator. Did not know that, but yep, okay. Yep, yep. And so, um, so you've got all of the, uh, you've got all of the, um, the oceans, you've got all the water, you've got all the atmosphere at the equator spinning at over 1,000 miles per hour. And the Earth is spinning right with it, so you don't really feel that, obviously, you know, but if the Earth were to put on the brakes on its spin, and what would that look like and what would happen? And science tells us today that that's never happened in the last, the, the mainstream generally accepted theory is that that's never happened in the, any, at any day, at any point in any day, at any time in the last 4 billion years that the earth has had a very steady rotation. And now uh, science tells us that the day used to be 22 hours, now it's 24 hours. So the day's slowing by a little bit, but that's been incremental over time. There hadn't been any sudden slowdowns. Okay. Yeah. So, so what would, what would the earth look like if it did slow down and, you know, uh, or potentially even come to a complete stop? I think if it, if it came to a complete stop, then you're talking about all of the momentum from the water and the wind just pushing onto shore at a thousand miles per hour. Mm -hmm. So you're talking about oceans just flooding onto continents at a thousand miles per hour. But if the earth just slowed down, by, uh, you know, 10%, 20%, uh, let's call it 20%. Then you've got 200 mile per hour uh, winds approaching the, uh, the land uh, from the west to the east on every major continent at the equator anyway. And it, of course, it slows down as you move you know, away from the equator towards the poles. But then you also have 200 miles per hour of uh, waves approaching the, um, the, the, <laughs> the land masses. So, yeah, so pretty terrifying, right? Uh, I Absolutely. And, and as you're going through this timeline, are, are we around during this? Like are humans on earth and able to see this or, uh, terrifyingly be a part of it? Yeah. Who knows? You know, I mean, it's all speculation. So this is, this is, I should, should start off by saying, you know, I want to ask the question, what would the earth look like if this were to ever happen? Mm -hmm. I, no, nobody thinks that this has ever happened. I haven't heard anybody talk about this. And so it's not like a generally accepted theory. It's nothing that, um, that I've heard people talk about anyway. And I'd love to hear from, from our viewers in the comments, if this is something that, that they've heard before, I've never heard it. Are people around was the question. And, you know, it's difficult difficult to know. It's difficult to know when this would have happened. I think that if we look at this event and we look at the evidence that's around the world for this event and we kind of rewind the clock based on what looks to be evaporating seawater on the west coast of several continents, including the United States, when you look at Salt Lake City, mm -hmm. then potentially we could pinpoint a date for when this might have happened. And then we would know if humans were around for it, you know, at what point. Um, 
and this might have happened in the past. Well, if they were around a 200 mile an hour wave, yeah. Um, most of them probably would have died of heart attacks, I you, think. Yeah, you <laughs> so there wouldn't so. be many of us left yeah, to see, yeah, <laughs> see yeah, something yeah. like that occur. Yeah, and it's a wave that could potentially be miles high. I oh. mean, you, you can be talking about a two-mile high wave, a three-mile high wave. You know, I mean, it, it, it would just, it's, we talk about mega tsunamis today, and, and I think the highest mega tsunami that we've ever measured was 1,700 feet. Most of them are a couple of hundred feet, you know, even the mega tsunamis. I, I don't know that there's a specific classification that defines how big a mega tsunami is, but it, they range from 300 feet to the biggest that I think that we ever measured was like 1958 and it was um, 1700 and something feet. So massive, massive. Skyscraper wave. size waves. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah. But, but this dwarfs that. I mean, this is a mega, <laughs> mega tsunami. This is like a whole other, um, a whole other scale. And so that's kind of what we're talking about today. What would the earth look like if this were to ever happen in, in human history or in the, in the history of the world, not yeah. human history, but the history of the world. And so what would the earth look like? And so, you know, what does saltwater do when it crashes, when it, when it, when it gets onto land, when it gets onto soil? And when you, when you mix salt with fertile soil, it becomes desert in a process called desertification. And, and so on the West coast of the United States, we see a lot of desert. We see a lot of, uh, you know, just torn. It just looks completely torn up. You know, on the East coast, you've got all this fertile green land, of course, you know, beautiful on the West Coast, as you go out here, you see it just looks like it's just been devastated by something. I mean, you know, there's there's so so there's reasons why that that we've come up with like geological reasons that we've studied the Earth, and there's reasons why all this stuff is formed. And if you can um, look over here, I think and first see Salt Lake City. You know, I mean, what would you think would happen if a two mile high wave start came at 200 miles per hour on you know from west to east and it crashed onto the western part of the United States? You'd probably expect to see a massive salt lake out there in the, in, <laughs> in the middle of a desert. Right. And so, you know, there's reasons why people have come up with explanations as to why all of these things have occurred. You know, Salt Lake City used to be or Salt Lake, Great Salt Lake used to be the part of a much bigger lake, um, Lake Bonneville. And, okay. um Also saltwater lake, but which also dried, which was in the Great Basin. But where did that come from? Um, if you read the explanations for where this stuff, where, where Lake Bonneville um, came from, it's very complex. It's like, you know, rainwater over millions of years um, had no outlet lid and it took minerals and salt from um, rocks, you know, and, and just, I think that a lot of these old explanations for what we see around the world are people decades ago, a hundred years ago, 200 years ago, you know, prior to satellite imagery, prior to Google Earth, prior to the computer, you know, just kind of in various spots around the world, doing their best to come up with theories of how all of these things were formed. And I don't know how much we've gone back now. I know we have, but I don't know how much people have really gone back and said, is this all really true? You mm -hmm. know, is it all, does it, does it really still make sense? Or are we just kind of going along with the traditional belief system, a traditional story that was manufactured you know, at a time when technology was uh, much weaker than it is today. Yeah. Well, you look at Google Earth has been around for 20 years, maybe a little bit longer. There are people today that are finding things on Google Earth that's never been found before, right? And when you talk about those individuals who were on the ground and were studying and, and coming up with theories, you know, they're looking at what's right in front of them. And to your point, I don't think we've ever taken the opportunity to look at it, you know, no pun intended, on a global scale and start to connect those dots. And theories evolve, new technology allows us to investigate things differently, and Google Earth gives us that opportunity, so why not ask those questions? Yeah, no doubt. You know, why not go on that on that journey to see if something's different and yeah. if if it's different than what we've known. No doubt. Yeah, well said. Now, this is something that I wanted to share because, again, I'm tired of thinking about it, so I got to release it. I got to get it out there. Um, you know, and I'm, I'm kind of tired of looking at Google Maps, to be honest with you. There's a boatload of evidence out there, and I hope to be able to talk about this with some people that know what they're talking about. Like, I, you know, I sell clothes for a living, but, but um, you know. That I translates want, well, right? Yeah, absolutely. You know, I want to get Randall Carlson on here. I want to get um, Jimmy Corsetti on here, um, you know, and, and he's, he's really dove into Africa and what, what, and what looks like a massive wave going into Africa. And I'm sitting there thinking, you know, we don't have an explanation for what 
happened, what looks like if it was water damage in Africa, we don't have an explanation for how that occurred. Mm -hmm. And I think this provides that explanation as at least a potential to go down this rabbit hole and think about and explore as a possibility. Is it, is it uh, true? I don't, I don't, you know, I, I don't know. But, but as you go around the world, um, there's certainly a good amount of evidence, you know, as we mentioned, the, the salt, as we mentioned, you know, kind of like what looks like water damage, you know, as you, as you see um, uh, waves crash onto the beach and then recede, you, you see these little ripples that are, you know, maybe a centimeter tall or an inch tall. And, you know, that's with a wave that's a couple of feet. Uh, what Randall Carlson, the work that he's done in, uh, Montana, Washington, he's seeing these massive ripples that look something like this, that, um, that could only have been formed from like a thousand feet of water, just on top of the earth, that it's the same ripples that you would see on a, on a beach, but it's just these massive, massive ripples in the ground. And of course, this is salt deposits that we have in between these here. I mean, this isn't snow. Uh, we're out here in the Great Basin. Uh, this is desert. And so, you know, um, it, it just, it seems like there is some evidence for what could be a different explanation than the one that we were taught in school. And there's a lot more evidence. And I wouldn't mind walking through some of that if you're cool with that. Yeah, let's get into it. Let's do it, man. And one thing, so the ripples in Montana, Montana's, I mean, just looking at it on the map right now, hundreds of miles away from any massive body of water that could cause those ripples. Right. Wow. It would have to be a big wave. Mm -hmm. You know, and, and I think, so what, what one th other thing that you have to remember is that the Laurentide ice sheet has been on the Northern hemisphere for like two and a half million years. And it just kind of, um, began to, to melt at, at the, uh, the end of the last ice age. So uh, technically we're probably still in an ice age, but, but 12,800 years ago to 11,600 years ago, um, the, um, the Northern part of the planet, um, um, would have had that ice sheet melt. And that's some of the work that Randall Carlson is doing that, um, a lot of those ripples could have been caused by melting glacier water. Okay. Um, and so, you know, we see it, uh, what, what, one of the interesting things that we see when we look, um, when we look at the Northern hemisphere is you see very green, very fertile land. And if this was covered with glacier for, you know, um, the last two and a half million years and it missed some of these massive events, then, um, it wouldn't have that salt. It wouldn't have the, the salt that the, that the equator, that the middle part of the earth would have been completely doused with. And, you know, if you think about waves coming through here, we're going to get to Africa later, but, but coming up into the Mediterranean, um, through Saudi Arabia, potentially, um, you know, out, uh, um, out at that point, um, you know, into the Indian ocean, then, um, then, um, you know, it, 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 the theory begins to make a bit of sense as you kind of look at the globe, uh, and you kind of step back and you see all of this desert land, which could have easily been caused by, by, um, ocean water, uh, with a big enough wave. And then you kind of get down into here, you see, you know, potentially the Colorado Rockies could have acted as a barrier um, or a stopping point for the water as it approached. Uh, you know, I mean, I think if you if you think about that much force going from the west to the east, some of the sediment that was being pushed from the west to the east kind of stopped at that point, you know, and I don't I'm not saying that it created the Colorado uh, mountains, but but you've got a big mountain range that goes all the way down. Um, you know, you've got increased elevation and then kind of when that stops and things kind of flatten out is, uh, right around this area. And, you know, what it looks like is that the land has been sort of smeared from the West to the East out into the ocean. And I, you know, um, of course I think that if there are, uh, we're going to talk a lot of speculation <laughs> in this video, that's kind of what's going to make it fun. Um, because I don't think that anybody's ever looked at it like this before. Mm -hmm. And so this is all speculation. This is not theory. This is a, what if type of a conversation, but what if a uh, two mile high wave for, uh, 12 hours or 24 hours or three days or whatever it may have been, um, just poured through from the west to the east, uh, just an inconceivable amount of water, would you start to see things like this smearing effect of the land um, going out um, from the west to the east and out into um, bodies of water? You know, so um, um, you see that bit of, uh, you see that there, 
And then as we get into South America, things get pretty interesting. Um, again, as you go south in South America, you kind of see the same smearing effect uh, where, you know, if you did have that, uh, the Andes mountain range continue and, and the water needed a place to, uh, and just kind of released and pushed through and actually got over um, and began to um, flatten out the land, uh, you would see this, you'd see this effect off the east coast of um, South America where the land would have gotten, you know, kind of smeared out into the water. And that's kind of what we see down there. And then as you come down to Antarctica, off the tip of South America, you see this very strange uh, uh, geological anomaly where it looks like water has just pushed through and kind of formed where it looks like it dug out the bottom of the ocean and just kind of pushed everything off to the east, off to the right. Um, so very interesting when you look at it from Google Earth and you take this um, this speculation, I'm not calling it a theory, <laughs> it's complete speculation, um, into account. I think a lot of times we forget the true force and power of water. When it's moving at a massive amount of speed with a lot of weight behind it and continuous, I mean, the ocean coming over, of course it's going to you know potentially smear that land. Yeah. It's going to cause widespread damage and and to your point, to your your idea, you can see some of that remnants of that destruction of those of those waves. It definitely appears to be possible just looking at a map. I'll, I'll put it that way. And again, you've got some some uh, you know uh, I, I'd call it smearing. I think is a decent word from <laughs> um, you know from uh, Isla, Isla Santiago. Um, out here, um, heading directly east towards the land. And once you get out here into the northern part of South America, you know, you've got this point right here where Ecuador and Peru kind of meet and you've got the Andes Mountains and that's about 15,000 feet of elevation there. So it's a big, big, tall mountain range in Ecuador and in uh, Peru, um, in Colombia, but going, you know, certainly uh, far south. But the water would have had a difficult time, you know, it would have had to have been 15,000 feet tall. Uh, which is three miles high to get past that and to, you know, to potentially create, um, to, to create what North America looks like. It would have had to have been, you know, three miles high. So I'm not suggesting that it was I'm suggesting that if this hypothetical event happened, that it would probably be about two miles high, maybe two and a half miles high, because it looks like that the land here was, this acted as like a shield, like a V, and then the water would have flown to the north and it would have flown to the south. And here we see if it were to have flown to the north, what Colombia, you know, may have um, gotten some, some, some of that water, some of the spray, you know, some of the, some of the water kind of going over the mountain range here and then settling in this area, which is less green, um, less foresty, a little bit less fertile as you look, um, you know, as you look at Colombia and the northern part of Venezuela. And then you head south where it gets a lot more interesting. And you look at this land off the coast of Peru and into Bolivia. And this would have been this, this V, this backwards V now. So the opposite as, as uh, kind of what you see in Peru and Ecuador, the, the opposite shape. This is where the water would have collected, uh, upside down V, if you will. And um, the water, you know, it, it looks like uh, that this is like just like what a what a crinkled paper. If you had a piece of paper on the on a on a table and you kind of just slid it with your hand and mm -hmm. you'd get all these crinkle marks. Um, potentially, if you had enough water coming into this area and you were just pushing the land and forcing the land from the west to the east, you might get a geological feature that kind of looks like this. You know, that kind of is like these little tiny mountain ranges that that looks like that. And then what would what would this area look like over here? Well, again, we have salt. We have a massive, massive salt flat. Um, so, Soler de Uni, I believe, is Uyuni, or is what this this area is called, and um, it's all salt. It's like massive salt deposits. And you might say, oh, that's pretty close to the ocean. You know, it could have been caused by a, just a regular tsunami. You know, um, this is twelve thousand feet in elevation. Wow, it's twelve thousand feet. 
in elevation? I mean, how, how do you get salt up there? I mean, of course there's an explanation, right? I mean, people, ha people see salt 12,000 feet high and they're like, Oh, let me write down an explanation for how this happened. Uh, you know, it's like, uh, rivers and like, um, you know, rocks and sediment. And maybe that's true. You know, maybe that's true. Again, what the hell do I know? I'm selling clothes, but, but it's, um, it, 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 um, it certainly begs you to ask the question, you know, as you see all of this salt in, in, you know, all up and down this coast, that's that's been essentially torn down to the bedrock. I mean, you're talking about like complete devastation here is what it, what it looks like it could be if there's any merit to this theory. And so, um, it gets interesting, I think, as you look at South America and then of course, you know, you don't really see, um, what you see in North America with the desertification, you don't see that in, in South America. You see very fertile, very green land with the Amazon, uh, rainforest, you know, um, which wouldn't have been possible if it was, you know, at some point covered with a lake or a, you know, a saltwater, uh, massive saltwater deposit. Well, are the mountains in South America on average, is their altitude higher than that of North America? Yeah, it is. It, it they are. That could help with spillover. No doubt from, from that kind of wave. No doubt, and they and it would have to have been because it's so much closer to the water. But yeah, there. I mean, there are peaks in South America that are twenty thousand feet tall. You know, I think there's a half a dozen peaks in South America that are twenty thousand feet. Uh, but then uh, maybe it's four or five. But but then you. Um, but you, uh, the the average of of um, the Andes up in, um, from Colombia, Ecuador, Peru, to my understanding is about, um, 13,000, 14,000 feet. Wow. So, okay. so could have easily withstood, um, a, uh, you know, a, a, a wave of, of that height, but not without some damage apparently. Right. Mm -hmm. And how long, I mean, in a situation like that, how long does it take for that water to recede? It's not instant. We know that, or at least I we believe that, Totally depends on the event. Totally depends mm -hmm. on how fast, if, if the earth was slowing over a long period of time, then the force would continue to accelerate, mm -hmm. you know, and if the earth just came to a quick stop, then you'd have just one or a quick slowdown and just drop 200 miles per hour instantaneously. Then you'd have kind of one massive wave go through. And then, um, you know, there wouldn't, there wouldn't be that continuation of uh, force behind it okay. as much. It's really impossible to know um, you know, with, with a lot of certainty, what that event would have looked like. I think the evidence, you know, for people who want to, um, if anybody thinks that this thing has, that this idea has any merit for people to want to look into this and to, you know, go down this rabbit hole and research it further, um, you can find the answers to a lot of those questions. Mm -hmm. So then we kind of move over to Africa and, um, you know, again, over here, there's just a tremendous amount of, evidence for, um, massive, massive waves and water and salt water coming in. And there's this thing called the Trans-Saharan Seaway, which is, again, it uh, was this huge sea in South, in Africa, in Northern Africa, that, that, um, saltwater ocean, basically in the middle of a continent, a uh, big, uh, Trans-Saharan Seaway. And, um, and, and that has been theorized to have been there because of all of the marine debris that has been deposited and the salt that's been found. I mean, there's so much salt. If you just dig into Africa and you look, um, Trans-Saharan Seaway was in this area, but, but I mean, salt deposits everywhere. And this has been mined and used for, um, thousands of years, you know, by human beings. I mean, you just zoom in, this is not snow, right? So we're, we're talking about salt here all over Africa. And where did it come from? Well, in this area, it's like, oh, it came from the Trans-Saharan Seaway, which is an ancient body of water that used to exist in Africa. Was that, is that really like, is that really true? Or did it just exist because some massive freaking wave, pot, you know, <laughs> crashed onto the shore and, and settled for several thousand years? You know, are we just making that guess? Because because we, because we never considered that an event of this magnitude could have been possible, are we just guessing at the Trans-Saharan Seaway? You mm -hmm. know, I don't know. That's I don't fair. Know. But I mean, you see evidence for water, you know, and the conventional explanation for this is, is wind. And so, you know, you see, you, you see the, the traditional explanation is that all of these lines that we see coming from the north and out to the east is, is wind. And you see it in Mauritania, in Western Mauritania, that, that all of this, and this honestly looks like the water is coming from the east and going out to the west. So it's interesting, you know, um, 
how this could have been formed. And I do have an idea on how that could have happened if it was, uh, if it was water and if it was going from the east out to the west. But, you know, you see all of these lines um, in Africa, which is going to be described as wind. Um, but is this really wind? Does this look like wind <laughs> to anyone else? Wind damage? Like, uh, you know, it's kind of hard to kind of hard to believe. It sure as hell looks like water to me. This is Emmy Kusi right here, um, which is a which is a um, a volcano. It's about twelve thousand feet high. Mm -hmm. It's about twelve thousand feet in elevation. And just off of the coast of off the side of Emmy Kusi here, you see what looks like um, sand that's been moved around by from from water that's sitting on top of the bedrock. I mean. Um, could be wind, sure, but man, that's quite a nice pattern there to have just come right around um, Emmy Kusi. And of course, no one would theorize that this was ever water because it's 12,000 feet in elevation, you know. But when you zoom into Emmy Kusi, what do you see? You see salt, <laughs> you know, at 12,000 feet high. That's not snow, that's salt, um, 100%. And uh, that's scientifically verified that in you a got. bowl 12,000 feet high hundreds of miles away from the ocean. Right, right. So it must have gotten there between the last time that it erupted mm -hmm. and now, you know, otherwise the eruption would have eliminated the salt. So how did that get up there? You know, you got salt deposits in low-lying areas all over the place out here. And and so you kind of look and say, okay, well if this was water, where did it come from? Well, you know, you, you keep tracing it up this direction and it comes from the Mediterranean Sea. And so people now are theorizing and speculating, well, was there an impact out in the Mediterranean Sea somewhere? And, and I know that there's people that are looking out here and saying, oh, this right here is a, is an impact site. And that could have been what caused, um, yeah, it's right. That, that little circle right there is an impact site. And that could have been a meteor and that could have caused this wave. But honestly, I don't think you can get that much freaking water from that um, from the Mediterranean Sea right there that just douses Africa that you know creates that much water that's going to flow all the way up twelve thousand feet out around Emikusi all the way out to the west as you see all these striations and lines moving this way um, out of western out of Mauritania and then heading out to the west. I just it just doesn't there's just not enough water. But where there is enough water. <laughs> Atlantic Ocean. The Atlantic Ocean, right? And so this, if this event were to have happened and you would have had all of this water traveling from the west to the east um, and filling the Mediterranean Sea, I mean, first off, covering northern Africa, mm -hmm. of course. And what do we see in northern Africa? Desert. All yep. desert, you know, which again, um, um, salinization, uh, you've got, um, uh, which is, you know, turning the fertile soil into desert sand, essentially. Could have been happened if this was all doused by water. And then you, you think about where the water would have gone, okay? Okay, so all of the water from this massive, massive um, section of the northern Atlantic Ocean, kind of because you've got this ice sheet up here over Europe, it has to flow into the Mediterranean Sea. And it has to flow onto North Africa and into the Mediterranean Sea. And so you're talking about, you know, miles high of water. Um, if the wave was two miles high, then this little area of the Mediterranean Sea could have been immensely higher, mm -hmm. significantly higher, you know, and, uh, potentially, you know, helped melt the ice sheets and, you know, um, but we won't get into that, but, but as then, and then, so the water would have poured down into Northern Africa and create some of these lines that we see right here and, um, also pour into Saudi Arabia. And what do we see in Saudi Arabia? We see what looks like, again, additional evidence of these massive water marks pushing through here. Um, into this area. Like, what is this? You know, is that, or, or is that really wind? Is that really possible? I mean, sure, maybe, of course it's possible. I mean, people have studied this for a hell of a lot longer than I have. I mean, I've been thinking about this for two weeks, right? <laughs> but, 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 then, but then think about like, okay, then the earth begins to spin again. Like the earth, okay, the earth is done from whatever this event was and it's slowed down. And this, again, we have to remember that this could have happened any day in the last four billion years. You mm -hmm. know, I mean, now, of course, the earth didn't look like this four billion years ago. It was Pangea, or, you know, or, but, but, but this could have happened at any day in the past, you know, uh, for, 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 for a very, very long period of time. All we needed was one day or several hours of a slowdown that could have been caused by anything. We'll get into some speculation on what it could have caused it in a little while. But, but then, uh, 
as you know, the moon takes, takes, takes back over and the earth begins to pick back up its speed and it starts to accelerate back to its regular speed, you would see the water begin to then be pushed out to the left. You would begin to see sort of these, you know, these lines form as it was being pushed south and then the earth begins to accelerate. You would see the water begin to then push back out to the west. And you see all of these lines indicating that that's what happened. It began to drain, you know, out to the west, out of Mauritania um, and into the ocean again potentially, um, you know, leaving the Trans-Saharan Seaway, potentially in all these low-lying spots as we dig into here and leaving salt deposits, you know, um, we see all these dunes, we see all this, this salt, this is, this is salt here, guys, this is, um, again, this is not snow, we're at the equator, this is all, this is all salt deposits out here in the middle of the desert, and so, you know, how did that get there? I mean, there's chevrons that are, that are, extraordinarily large that, that uh, you know, in uh, northern Morocco that that um, look like they, uh, and I won't be able to find them, I'm sure right now, but, but that look like it was from water coming from the north, coming from the Mediterranean Sea, um, you know, and so the evidence is all over that this is possible, that this is a, that this is a possibility, but I don't know that anybody's taken this event into account where potentially the earth stopped spinning for a very short period of time. Um, and, and that that is kind of what helped to, um, to create some of the geological formations that we see today. Well, and, and what, what precedent do we have to kind of comprehend what that would look like? Right. We've, we've never in a, on a global scale seen the sudden stopping and a large body of water moving. I mean, we live in Florida. So even when you see storm surge in Florida and the water recedes, not all of it's gone. There are huge puddles that are left behind. That water finds the path of least resistance. So it starts to leave those similar marks that you saw in Northern Africa here in Florida. Yeah, it's just, it's it's wild to think about. It yeah. truly is. It, yeah, is. it is wild. Yeah, it seems possible anyway. Yeah. You know, it seems like it's worth discussing. It seems like it's worth putting the idea out there and being able to have some people that, um, you know, that want to discuss this, that want to think about it, that want to research it, um, you know, put, put some more time into it and, and kind of go down that rabbit hole and figure out, you know, is this possible? Um, you know, just looking at uh, salt maps and where we've mapped the soil of of the earth, you see all of the the majority of the salt um, in the soil that's been mapped is all over the equator. Mm -hmm. I mean, it's all the biggest portion of it's all on the equator, and the biggest portion, of course, is in the western part of the United States. As you look at it, and you don't see it up in the northern hemisphere, you don't see it in um, Europe. Again, where ice would have been, the Laurentide ice sheet would have been covering. You don't see it there. You see it much more towards the equator and of course people are screaming at the you know their youtube channel and saying well it's hotter at the equator you know and blah, blah blah yeah get it check but you know you've also got the amazon <laughs> at the equator and you don't you know you don't see it you, you know you don't see it there so um anyway you know i think maybe worth um spending a couple minutes of just pure speculation on what could have potentially caused the earth to slow down at, okay. uh, one day in its in its distant past um and just a couple of, you know, I guess I have no idea. I, you know, but, but if you're to, to sit back and think about, okay, what is, what's possible? What could have potentially, um, um, gotten in the earth, gotten in the way of the earth's rotation for a brief period of time. And you, you kind of think about two things. You think about one is planet X mm -hmm. and planet X is this, um, now it's gaining some credibility as something that might actually exist, which is a, 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 a planet that's massive. That's not on the, the flat plane of the uh, solar system, it just comes in once every whatever twelve thousand years or twelve five thousand years. Okay, yeah yeah, 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 yeah. So if that passed close enough to the Earth at some point in the distant past, then potentially that could have caused, as it was passing, it could have you know pulled the Earth in some way that caused its rotation to. Um, to slow down for a brief period of time. I, that one for me is probably lesser likely. Um, so I wanted to mention it first and get it out of the way. What I think is more likely is a, um, a pole shift, a geomagnetic pole shift that, uh, geomagnetic pole shift that could have caused, um, the earth to, um, slow down for a very brief period of time. And so, 
we know that those happen um, periodically. We know that by studying lava that has cooled, we're able to pinpoint where the magnetic North Pole was, where the magnetic South Pole was, and we're able to align the rock with um, the, the the magnetic North and magnetic South. And so we can date the we can um, we can date. Um, when, when, uh, where the, where the, uh, magnetic poles were going back and we know that they change. And usually it's about every three to 400,000 years that you see, um, the magnetic pole, a uh, magnetic pole reversal. And so the last magnetic pole reversal that we had was 780,000 years ago. And so we're way overdue for mm -hmm. a, for a magnetic pole reversal. And there was some event that happened about 41,000 years ago, but it wasn't major. It wasn't a complete reversal, but, um, and there's uh, ongoing scientific debate and study about that event. But, um, but anyway, 780,000 years ago was the last big reversal. And so, <clears throat> you know, what science tells us is that when that happens, um, nothing to worry about, you know, just, uh, okay. everything will be fine. You know, <laughs> the birds might fly in a different direction and, you know, you might lose some, uh, species of birds cause they get confused. Our <laughs> navigation across the world deals mm -hmm. off of, yeah. you know, magnetic yeah. North. And, and, and when we, when you first were talking to me, approached me about doing this episode and you were talking about pole shifting. Yeah. I was under the impression that magnetic north is magnetic north and magnetic south is magnetic south. It's always been that way. I didn't understand until I started doing research, and we can definitely share a picture of this, is that the poles move and have been moving. They're right. not They're not. The static. magnetic poles, yeah. The magnetic poles have been moving. Yeah. And to just casually say, well, yeah, it'll be all right if yeah. they move. Everything will be fine. No, yeah. Yeah. That, that does not sound happen? okay to me. Yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah, the truth is we don't know, but people are saying that it's going to be a non-event just to keep people calm and to keep people focused on, you know, war and <laughs> politics and, you know. When they tell that. you to calm down, that's when you panic. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Right, right. Stay in place. Don't, don't <laughs> move. Yeah, everything's going to be okay. Yeah, okay. Um, yeah, so we don't know exactly what's going to happen with a geomagnetic pole reversal. And again, we're way overdue. And um, <clears throat> there's a lot of evidence right now that the poles are um, moving. And, mm -hmm. and um, um, in fact, the poles are moving. <laughs> they, they're, uh, the, the, the North Pole is just flying right now. And it's been accelerating since the 1990s. And it mm -hmm. just, it's kind of, it kind of had been for the last 150 years, kind of just in place, but kind of just hovering around, um, uh, in place around, I guess, uh, what Greenland and Canada, you know, up in that area. But now it's getting, it's right, it's moving past the geographic North Pole at a very fast rate. And it was, it had been moving roughly nine miles per year. It's now up to 40 miles per year that the thing is moving. It's a car going down the highway. <laughs> right, right. Yeah. Of our magnetic pole. Right, right. In a straight line. So it clearly has some destination that it's going to. It's not like kind of just meandering around. Like it's on a mission right now, going somewhere. Um, and uh, the South Pole, the South Magnetic Pole is doing the same thing. And it's moving. And and then we've got this, um, we've got this South Atlantic anomaly that's forming uh, between South America and Africa. The bigger part of it is closer to South America. And and when satellites fly through the South Atlantic anomaly, um, they have to oftentimes shut down their communication because they're they're not getting protection from the magnetic field. It's a, a very weak area of the magnetic field. And in addition to that, the Earth's magnetic field has been weakening for the last couple of hundred years. And um, there's debate on the percentage that it's been weakening, so I'm not going to put a number out there. But it's been weakening, and the weakening seems to be accelerating, just as the poles are accelerating. So something's happening. And... Um, um, something's happening with the magnetic field of the earth and magnetic field of the earth is ultimately, um, formed and controlled by the core of the earth, the inner iron core of the earth. And so we don't know what's happening down there. You know, we don't know what's happening a hundred miles below us, let alone mm -hmm. at the middle of the freaking planet. We have no idea. And so, you know, being able to predict that and to be able to tell where the poles are going, um, 
is impossible. And, um, and so I think that's kind of the reason why people are kind of just, Oh, you know, nothing to see here. I'm sure everything will be okay. <laughs> Cause it's something that we don't have control over, Yeah, you know? And, and so the question becomes, is it possible that during one of these events, um, in the earth's distant past, um, forget about, uh, you know, a, a potential future event. Is it possible that with a magnetic pole shift, that the earth slows down for a short period of time, um, just based on what's happening with the core of the earth. Mm -hmm. And so if the core of the earth begins to whatever, you know, alt, uh, um, stop, stop rotating, stop spinning around or, or, or spin in a different direction or, um, whatever it might be, could that impact the mantle? Because the mantle and the core are coupled. I mean, there, you know, there's some, there's, there's relate, there's, there's a high, there's correlation there. So, so is that possible? Um, you know, as we look at like, um, climate records of past pole shifts, there's, there's definite evidence of significant climate change and climate impact during prior pole shifts. And so that kind of leads you to believe that eh, maybe it's a bit more dramatic than just like, um, you know, uh, North is South, South is North. Now get used to it. Yeah. Right. Right. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Um, but it's important to note also, of course, that this, we're not talking about a geographic movement of the mm -hmm. poles, you know, that, that it's not as if, you know, the earth is gonna, I think, um, uh, Chan Thomas wrote in his book in the sixties, the Adam and Eve story, um, that there was going, that when the poles shift and he predicted it, and apparently so did Edgar Casey and a handful of other people that when the, when the, when the poles shifted and it was going to happen soon, that, that the geographic poles were going to shift and that the earth was going to essentially rotate 90 degrees mm -hmm. and the CIA actually classified classified this book for like 60 years, something like that. I mean, it just became unclassified like 10 years ago. Um, there's some discussion and debate about whether or not they released the full book or not, um, and why they would have classified it in the first place. But but he's proposing a geographic pole shift. And so I'm not suggesting that. I'm suggesting that if this is, if there's any possibility of any of this complete speculation being true, that all we would really need would be for um, the earth to slow down for a, for a short period of time. And um, you wouldn't need a geographic pole shift. You would just need a magnetic pole shift that could be the um, the cause of that event to, to, to happen. Well, you know, I'm a visual person. And so visualizing the earth slowing down, even in the, even in the slightest, uh, when you're in your car and you slow down by two, three miles an hour, you, you, you feel it in your body a little bit, yeah. not too terribly much, but you know, that open glass of sweet tea, that water's rushing forward because there's nothing acting upon it. Right. So it, it doesn't have to be a full stop. It doesn't have to be even 200 miles an hour, you know, 100 miles an hour, 50 miles an hour, slowing down, that water is still going to continue forward until it's acted upon something. And that's the mountains that you've shown earlier yeah. um, and and moving up into those high elevations and, and things like that. So it might be a situation where we kind of maybe just stumble across the room and like, what was that? Right. But all of that water is going to continue forward and, and just cause absolute havoc and skyscraper size yep. tsunamis. Yep. Yeah, no doubt. Yeah. Yeah. So you mentioned the driving in the car thing. Now, now imagine driving in a car with a fish tank sitting in the passenger seat <laughs> and the fish tank, you know, saltwater fish tank full of fish, you know, full of sand. And you're, you're on cruise control going 80 miles per hour and you slam on the brakes, you know, and what does that do to your dashboard? Where, where does all the, where all the fish go? Where does the water go? Where does this, you know, <laughs> ruins my hair to begin with. Yeah, for sure. Yeah. Your hair screwed. Um, but yeah, so it's interesting to think about, you know, I was just hoping that, um, uh, we could, you know, get on and talk about this and, and just see what people think. Um, let me know what you guys think in the comments section. I want to know if you think there's any possibility that this could be true. Um, do me a favor. If you, um, think that there's something to this and that people should be talking about it, share this. Um, share it with some friends, share it with some family, whatever you think. Let's get the word out there. Uh, let's help this channel blow up. I'd really appreciate that. Um, hit the like button and, um, yeah, let's, let's talk about it in the comment section, man. You guys know how active I've been in the comment section. So, um, I would love to, uh, to continue this conversation and just let me know if I'm crazy. That's, that's fine too. I'm sure we'll get some of that. That's cool. I've heard that before. So um, all good there. And um, yeah, we got some good guests coming on. Next week, we've got Chris Cottrell. 
who is a Carolina Bay's expert. He was at the Cosmic Summit, did an incredible presentation there. He was rushed, though. Admittedly, he was rushed on it. And so we're going to dig. We're going to take more time to really dig into that. If you guys haven't heard of the Carolina Bay's, it's an amazing, amazing um, theory that has to do with um, the impact at the Younger Dryas 12,800 to 11,600 years ago, um, potentially explaining those Carolina Bay's. And, um, and, and, you know, there's an open question of when, when that, when they were formed. And so we're going to be talking about that. Um, Johanna James just confirmed. So I'm excited to have her on the show. Um, I just talked to Guy Harvey last week. And so I, I dropped that one on the, my other channel, Matt Bell Legacy. Um, let me know if you guys think that Guy Harvey would be a fit. You know, it's more of like, a, I didn't want to interrupt the whole um, ancient Civ thing. And, uh, you know, but Guy Harvey is a great dude. He's a, he's a good guy. He's a great guest. So I'd be happy to drop this one on this channel if anybody's in. If, uh, um, let, me, let me know what you guys think, though. Um, and um, yes, yeah, some more exciting guests coming on. You know, I will be jumping into the UAP topic over the next couple of months. So um, Tim Burchett um, uh, seems interested in coming on. I've, uh, uh, Morgan Bell, who's the founder of the Scientific Coalition for the Study of UAP. Um, so a lot of good good um, guests that are up and coming on the show. And so um, look, man, appreciate everybody. Appreciate everybody tuning in and I uh, hope you enjoyed this. And again, um, like, subscribe, share, comment. Let me know what you guys think in the comments section. Peace.